Happy holidays. There is a decent chance that you've been lucky enough to get Monster Hunter Rise and or its expansion Monster Hunter Sunbreak for Christmas. The game's also coming out on PlayStation Xbox later on in January. So if you're also here from the future, Hello, I hope 2023 is doing well for you. How's the weather? Either way, here are some quick tips to help you enjoy starting out with the game and making the beginning early bits a little bit smoother and more enjoyable. Tip number one, don't use the guardian armor and weapons unless you already understand what they are and know that you want to use them. So when Capcom released the Sunbreak expansion, they also added in Guardian Armor and Guardian Weapons. The weapons are really powerful for the sections where they're relevant in the game, and the armor is similar, but for defense. And to top it all off, they're also some of the most easily upgradable and craftable weapons that you can come by. So what's the catch? Why am I telling you not to use them? Well, these weapons were added to the game as tools to easily push you through low rank and most of high rank so that you can quickly reach this stuff, the new stuff in the expansion pass in Sunbreak. And if that's what you're going for, wonderful. But if, you, if you're buying the game and you wanna play through the whole of it, then the Guardian weapons and armor will give you a very different experience to how you would normally play the game. And once you've gotten past the part where the Guardian armor and weapons are relevant, you'll be in for quite a nasty difficulty spike while also making you skip over a lot of the core features of the game. Ultimately, it's your choice, so use them if you want. But if you're new to the series, especially if you're new to the series, then I strongly recommend not using them as they'll ruin the fun that you could have early on while making it more difficult for you to pick up the skills that you'll want to get early on to have a lot of fun further down the road. Moving on to tip number two, talk to people. In the village, people will sometimes have little speech bubbles above them. That means that they have something important to say. This will normally give you a new quest to complete. And for the most part, those quests will unlock special features and they can range from new weapons to extra bits and bobs for your farm, Argosy. Uh, it's a bit of a no brainer really, but the other, half, the other half of this is to actually complete those quests that reward you cool things. Most of the time, they'll only appear once you've talked to someone first, but there are a few instances where that isn't the case. So make sure to check your quests and tick off all of the ones that unlock new things for you to do. And that leads us on to tip number three. Farming. This isn't Stardew Valley, so thankfully we don't have to farm things by hand anymore, but farming is a, still a really important aspect of Monster, the Monster Hunter series, to the point that I have just realized that farming isn't actually in the game anymore. Uh, I've gone through this entire script before realizing it. Uh, they're actually called something different in this game, so tip 3.1. This isn't Stardew Valley because instead of farming, we're sending our cats off to buy stuff in cute little submarines. Finding and speaking to Rondine will help you under understand the mechanic better, but this Argosy is going to be the main method that you get most of the materials to craft different kinds of potions, drugs, drinks, and the like to get you through the game. Knowing which items to farm early on is also half the battle. So here's a quick rundown. It's very rough, uh, just about the first couple things you ought to farm. So the first thing you'd want is probably honey. Honey is one of the most important crafting items in the game. It's used to turn potions into mega potions so you can heal more. And it's also used to craft catalysts. Catal catalysts don't do anything on their own, as the name implies, uh, but are instead used to make a bunch of really, really useful items like max potions that will completely heal you in one go, or demon drugs to increase your attack power, dash juice to decrease the rate of your stamina, and other things as well. We've also got valuable things like God Bugs and Mangadora. Those are both used in making max potions. Uh, and then other things that you might want early on are Mite Seeds, Armor Seeds, and Blue Mushrooms. And speaking of Blue Mushrooms, this leads us onto tip number four. 
Antidotes are a trap. Some monsters in the game will be able to poison you, and understandably, that's not a good thing. Uh, when you get poisoned, the game will tell you to drink an antidote to fix your poison problem, but that's not actually the best way to deal with poison. You see, the issue with antidotes is that it takes ages to finish them. So if you're already low on health, you might die to poison before you finish drinking the antidote. So instead of antidotes, use some of the blue mushrooms I've mentioned earlier alongside your antidotes to craft into herbal medicine. Herbal medicine will heal you of poison much faster while also recovering a small amount of health. The only downside to this is that you can carry less herbal medicines compared to antidotes. However, you can fix this issue by assigning herbal medicines to your radial menu and bringing extra antidotes and mushrooms in your inventory. That way, once you run out of the herbal medicines, when you try and click on the radial menu, it will allow you to craft more of them while you're fighting the monster, and that's really, really great. Also, bonus points for doing this with the ingredients for max potions. It will make a lot of your quests very smooth. Moving on to tip 5, unlock those silkbind attacks. In the game, you have weapon class specific attacks that will let you do special things, like blocking an attack and then getting more powerful as a result of it while using the lance, or jumping into the air and doing a big descending explosion attack with the switch axe, uh, and you know, a lot more as well. Most of them are unlocked through progressing through the game, but there is one silkbind attack for each weapon class that can be a little tricksy to unlock because they are unlocked by crafting or upgrading eight weapons of that class or type of weapon. And then once you've done that, you go talk to a dude, uh, the dude that gives you the arena quests. The way this game counts the upgrades is a little funny. So if you're later on in the game and you have money to spare, you can just craft the same cheap weapon eight times. But if you're super early on, it may be better to hold off a little bit to save money while you can be spending it on better things. But overall, remember to craft your weapons, otherwise you could be completely overlooking one of your switch skills. Speaking of spending money, tip number six is periodically the merchant will have a sale. Not only does this give you a chance to win a trinket or other items in the lottery, but it will also reduce the cost of everything within the shop. Well almost everything within the shop and this is a really good time to bulk buy the items that you've that you're going to use during the hunt things like the potions the antidotes life powders materials to help you craft traps or bombs and especially if you're playing the ranged weapons then using these sales to buy ammo is a really really useful thing to do as it's going to save you a lot of money in the long run Tip number seven then is choosing a weapon. Back when I first played Monster Hunter yonks ago, I went in with no advice and I kept swapping between different we weapons quest after quest. And this made it more difficult for me because I was fighting monsters with one unupgraded weapons, but on top of that, without really knowing what the weapons did. And because I didn't know how to use any of them properly, I had a pretty rough time, which made me think that it was the weapons fault, which made me swap weapons again, and that led to fighting even more difficult monsters with unupgraded weapons, and it spiraled out of control. Thankfully, that's probably very unlikely to happen in the more modern Monster Hunter games, but one of the big tips that I can suggest to you is Rise has gotten a training room, so I strongly recommend going in there and testing out all of the weapons before you start playing loads of the game so that you can find ones that you feel work for you and how you want to play the game. If you'd like my own recommendation in which weapons to try and look down first to see if you have an interest in them. Uh, obviously I'm a lance guy and I've got a bunch of other videos that will help you out with the lance. It's a fun weapon and it's got some really interesting stuff in Rise and Sunbreak, but if you've tried that one out and it doesn't take your fancy, then I'd recommend either the Switch Axe or the Hunting Horn, as they're also weapons that have been given a lot of love in Rise. I'm also aware that some people like having the ability to swap between the weapon classes depending what monster they're fighting. And a quick bonus tip for people that want that 
is that you can actually refund the materials that you've spent on making a weapon by unupgrading it in the smithy, and that way you can reduce the amount of extra grind that you're going to need to do by reusing materials for different weapons. Moving on, tip number eight. This is bit a bit more of a public service amount, announcement more than a tip. Within the Monster Hunter series, you have a number tied to your character called your hunter rank. And this increases slowly as you progress through the story. And once your story is finished, your hunter rank will be uncapped and it will slowly rise in accordance to the number of quests that you do. And this is important because post game quests are unlocked at certain hunter rank or HR intervals. So the PSA is that unlike any other Monster Hunter game that you may or may not have played, the extra HR that you would be getting or that you used to get from doing all the quests in the low ranks while your hunter rank was still capped isn't accumulated at all. So this means that if you complete every quest and then beat the final boss, your HR will be the same as if you only completed the bare minimum number of quests to reach the final boss and then that quest. So if you're like me and you like to tick off all the quests, it may be worth waiting until the story is over to grab the extra quests to maximize the HR gain that you get. However, it should be noted that HR isn't too difficult to acquire, so don't worry too much about this tip, and don't prevent yourself from doing any of the quests that seem appealing to you while you're going through the store. Ultimately, we're here to have fun, not to maximize the efficiency within the game. Tip nine has something to do with one of the more difficult to obtain achievements in the game, and it has to do with golden spirit bugs. So one of the achievements in Monster Hunter Rise is to collect 1,000 golden spirit bugs. And honestly, it's a massive grind if you have to go out of your way to get them. So I would strongly recommend gathering them passively while doing other quests to save you the grind later on down the road. One of the biggest things that I can recommend is to run and grab some golden spirit bugs during the 20 to 60 seconds that you have once you've completed the quest, especially if you're in the shrine ruins as the tunnel in the middle of the map has a bunch of easily accessible bugs to get at. On a similar note to spirit bugs, Tip 10 is about great wire bugs. The way great wire bugs work is really simple, but also somewhat misleading, especially early on, and it can lead you to misunderstanding how they work. So firstly, great wire bugs are permanent. Once you place them down, it will stay in that spot and it will stay in that spot across quests. So you don't have to worry about farming hundreds of them because once you've placed one down, it's going to always be there. And I guess you can think of it a bit like building a bridge. Once you've built the bridge, you've got it and you, you, the map is gonna remember that you have it. The second half of this then is that you also don't have to worry about the seemingly limited number that you get at the start. Just place them down where you think that they'll be useful as you'll get more as you progress through the game. In short, you can't waste great wire bugs, so go crazy with them. Don't FOMO and not place any down until the end of the game. As it's the holidays, it's only fair that I give you a few extra tips as a bonus. So here are some bonus tips. Firstly, the Kahoot Nest. You've got a Kahoot Nest at the top of the tree in the Palico Ranch section of the village. You'll be able to gather some free items from it once every quest. However, if you leave it up there alone for five quests, you get better rewards slash more of them. You'll know once it's maxed out because the egg will turn gold. And if you've unlocked Elgado in the Sunbreak expansion, you'll also get another nest in that area. However, it's worth noting that once the egg is gold, you won't get any extra benefits for leaving it. So if you see it and it's gold, just gather it immediately. Another useful thing to know about are Dango vouchers. We don't really have time to cover the whole Dango food system, but in short, eating Dango before you go on a quest will give you higher starting health, higher stamina, and it will also give you a chance for special effects during the mission. If you use a voucher, you will increase the odds of those special effects happening, but getting the vouchers can be a little tricky sometimes. The easiest method I've found is to do the multi-mix option while at the canteen, 
and put in just a whole ton of ingredients. You'll get a ton of useful useful items from it and you should also have a new speech bubble from one of the canteen operators and after talking to them they'll give you a bunch of vouchers. Our final bonus tip is getting a start on those cats and dogs early. Palicos and Palamutes are really really useful. They're great allies while you're out on a hunt and they can also do a huge variety of things back in the hub but a number of those things requires having a lot of them so firstly, you need to get a lot of them so that you can send them out in the Argosy or send them out in sort of bands of raids with the Miasonary system. But the other thing is that they have a lot of variety in how they support you during quests. And until you reach the Sunbreak part of the game, you're not going to be able to alter the skills on an individual cat or dog. And even if you would want to, once you've reached that section, you would need the skills that you want to transplant onto that dog on another cat or dog that you own. Sorry, that's a lot of cats and dogs here. So in short, stock up on loads of cats, loads of dogs, and get them in lots of different varieties, because that way, You'll have loads of different skills to play with, and I strongly recommend as well that you go and use the different versions to see which skills that you'd like to use during the hunt. And with that, I think we've come to the end of the video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps this video get noticed by the algorithm and spreads it to other people so we can share these tips with more. Speaking of tips, if you've got your own, please leave them in the comments. It would be a really great thing to do because you'll help turn this video into sort of like a treasure trove of great advice for people starting out. And that also means that if you like what you see here, go read the comments because there'll be more tips by other people down there waiting for you to be read, waiting for them to be read by you. And finally, after all of that, I want to thank you for watching right until the end. Happy holidays and see you next time.